was supposed to start uh, 45 minutes ago and go on for an hour and 15 minutes. I always say uh, the Tivaria and uh, the head of the Tivaria especially are uh, quite unpredictable. I've gotten used to it in life, so I'm going to try to be zokhe here for a Nes Galui, a revealed miracle, to somehow put an hour and 15 minutes into 45 minutes, and that's going 15 minutes over time. But the uh, Rebbeiter said I could do it. Speaking of Rebbeiter, I want to start off with a big Yishal Koach, as every year, to all of his organization and to what I personally consider every year the most dramatic day of the year. I'm not trying to sound dramatic. I do, between me and myself, believe this day is the most dramatic day of the year. Why? Because, like in all yeshivot, 90% um, <clears throat> if not more of our day and our week and our month in yeshiva, we address Hashem's mitzvot, Hashem's dinim, Hashem's midot. We have an obligation at Torah to try to learn God's midot and emulate them. <clears throat> Some yeshivot, it's not 90%, it's 100%. I personally have a problem with that. What happens today, today we go in one chamber deeper. And that's the way I see it. And this deeper chamber requires a lot, a lot of maturity, which I think lack of emuna often revolves around that. And we're going to be elaborating on that. Because today we're not addressing the mitzvot of Hashem, not the Torah of Hashem, not the dinim and not the midot of a kadosh baruch That's what we do all year round. Today we are addressing him with a capital H. Him, him. Now addressing him with a capital H, a kadosh baruch directly causes most of us, if not all of us, to move uncomfortably, usually in our chairs, for reasons. We can spend all these forty-five minutes talking about the reasons. I'll touch upon two reasons. One reason is because God is hard to relate to. Tefillin, I can feel and touch. Tzitzit, I can see. Besamim, I can smell. Rabbis who are there to open up our eyes to get to know God, Chazal say that explicitly. Rabbis have beards, Tzadikim have peot. I can put a picture of them on the wall. You put a picture of a Kadosh Baruch on the wall, you went against the Yisu of Odazara, Batorah. You cannot put a picture of a Kadosh Baruch on the wall as much as you would like to be inspired. You did that, you're a pagan. It's hard to relate. How can I be expected to relate to he, capital H, who does not have a beard and does not have ears or eyes, at least not in the sense that we know. That's... Question number one. That's the first difficulty. It's easy for me, even if I become very firm, whatever that may mean, I can keep myself busy from morning to night with mitzvot, with shulchan aruch, and with that, hopefully also the heart of it all, becoming a better person, and becoming having better midot, which is the underlying thrust of what we try, Kabina tries to give over here in the Tivarian, but at the end of the day, often, too often, I could use all these trees in order to hide the forest. Or if you wish, I can manage all year round in my entire life with the branches, but avoid the, actually, the actual tree itself. And why do I allow myself to sound as such? Because <clears throat> the very essence and trunk of the tree of the entire Torah, you hear it, if you're somewhat of a thinker, in the very introducing of Torah itself. Torah starts off, Anochi Hashem Alokecha, Sherotzei Ticha Meretz Mitzrayim Ibeit Avadim. A deep ear hears the opening word of the entire Torah is Anochi. It's about me, and I'm sharing myself and revealing myself. And you can find this in the Zohar in many different places. It's expressed in the Gemara Masechet Shabbat for those who want afterwards. We don't have time to elaborate now. <coughs> Torah is about Hashem revealing and sharing Himself with Bnei Yisrael, ultimately with mankind. Deeper revelation and sharing of himself with us. If we avoid him, we're avoiding the very essence and heart of the entire Torah. These are not my words. You can find it everywhere. You can find it in the Rambam. 
The Rambam will count mitzvah number one in the 613 mitzvot that he organizes conceptually as opposed to Sefer Chinuch who goes according to the order of the Parshiot starting with Puravu. No, 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 no. I'm conceptual. I'm Mr. Organization. He's the master of organization. Anybody, the more the Rambam you learn, the more you're absolutely amazed how in one lifetime a human being can organize Torah to that extent. And as organized as he is, he positions mitzvah number one. Anochi Hashem Elokecha Sherotzeiticha Meretz Mitzrayim Ibeit Avadim. That's a mitzvah. It doesn't sound like a mitzvah. It's a statement which is a mitzvah. Not everybody agrees with the Rambam. It's a machloket Rishonim. He holds that it's a mitzvah. What's the mitzvah? Hamanat Elokut. What we call it. Believe in Hashem. It's registered explicitly in the end of Masechet Makot. Anybody here who's learned Masechet Makot to the last two dapim? The Gemara says there, that's the source for 613 mitzvot. We all know, six Taryad mitzvot, that's the basis of Judaism. Thank God a billion times we're not Christians. It sounds politically incorrect, I don't care. I don't know, oh, a thing to the Christian world. They owe to us hundreds and thousands of years of apology. Baruch Hashem, Shalos Anigoy, and specifically not a Christian. The world of Sheker. They're very close, you can see them from here. <clears throat> the deeper level as to why speaking about HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself causes us to move uncomfortably in our chairs is because if I consider him and not his dinim and his mitzvot, and I'm not busy all day only with a sugya, but I address him, that means I'm addressing the actual source of my life. And that's not comfortable for us because that doesn't sit well with our Western secular side that to a great extent is part of us. And that is that my life actually does not belong to me because the underlying unspoken or spoken, mostly unspoken, maybe subconscious message that we get from Western secular media, culture, I am my own boss. I own my life. Oh yes? When did the last time that you hear that in the United States of America, somebody was allowed to commit suicide? Let me jump off the skyscraper. My girlfriend dumped me. I don't want to live anymore. My pitam, nobody lets you do that. But it's my life. Clearly they agree that it's not your life. Lemai said they don't agree. On a daily basis, I own my life. Torah says, you don't own your life. Did you make your life? No. If you didn't make my life, your, your life, I made your life. It's for me to define what life is. That doesn't sit well with us. We don't like hearing it. We don't like being reminded that our life is limited. And as they are ready to Zohar back in those days, you were by Rashbi this week, right? Some of you. <clears throat> Even in the Rashbi already says it in the Zohar. Even in those days, today for sure, people will play all kind of psychological games, but to face the fact that one day we are actually going to die. And when we address the source of life, we're also addressing the world of death. The ultimate unknown, the veil in which we don't see anything on the other side. We don't feel comfortable with these things. And therefore we try as hard as possible to avoid addressing Him. Capital H. That's what I meant that one needs tons of maturity to come and to address not the mitzvot and the masech of the Kadosh Baruch Hu right now. To address Him. It requires, first of all, maturity. I highly recommend, like Rabina did also, to really take advantage of this day. And even if some of the people, as myself, may be boring to you, try not to fall asleep. I'm assuming Rabina would say, he gives a head there, that if somebody's head is going down, take your elbow, gently put it in his uh, ribs, wake him up. It, this is not a day to sleep. And I'm saying in advance, even if I'm not the most exhilarating, exciting speaker, me or anybody else during the day, don't sleep today. Sleep tonight. <clears throat> Let's start. Torah speaks about itself as etz chaim hi as a tree. As I alluded to a moment ago, the actual trunk of the tree is the topic of today's discussion. Everything else are branches as important as they may be, 
when the tree receives at its roots, at its trunk, water, life, all the branches of the tree are alive. When it does not, all the branches do not. I deeply believe personally, so many people and many different sects of religion, religious Judaism of all colors that we face in our generation today in the most religious settings, many kids going off the derech, I, there's many, 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 many multiple different levels, emotional, psychological, one of the core issues that's avoided and not addressed, the kid never got to address real, for honest, genuinely, the topic of today's discussion. Last night, my wife and I, <coughs> where we live in Yom Mashav Yonatan and Ramat Golan, we went to hear, it was an evening, with a person, it was quite amazing to see a person who was so open about his life story. The person went through uh, sexual abuse when he grew up in a Haredi home, <coughs> where he was not allowed to ask any questions, <clears throat> and that started off a very, very challenging life. Later on in his 40s, he was diagnosed with bipolar 2, and he gave over the story. This includes hospitalizations. This is after having gone through cancer. Anyways, <clears throat> he, was, he went on and on. We were not allowed to ask any questions. In the teeth area, you're not allowed to not ask questions. You're not going to ask questions. Rabina is going to come to the ribs I mentioned before, and he's going to poke you in your ribs. Why aren't you asking questions? We can't I promise all answers. If you're not asking questions, you're not going to find God. As opposed to approach, don't ask questions. You'll find God. We said the opposite. Ask questions. You may find God. Just one thing we demand. And that's Rabina's character trait that I most admire. Be honest with yourself in the search. When you're asking questions, be genuine and honest. That's the only recipe. That's the recipe for success. And therefore, what this day requires is maturity, freedom of thought, being honest and free on the way to search for what is the truth of this world. Let's delve into it. I want to emphasize, I've shared this here with guys before earlier on in the year, I believe the issue over here is not philosophy. It's not Jewish philosophy. I always say Jewish philosophy, from my perspective, is an oxymoron. I'm not interested in philosophizing. The issues at discussion have an effect on every bit, not only of mitzvot, every bit of life and every bit of human existence. Because the issue of today is not philosophy. The issue of today is clarity of mind. Do I have a clear worldview? Do I not have a clear worldview? A person has a clear, sharp, strong worldview. I know such people they end up producing a personality which is clear, sharp, and strong. People that live in a fragile, unclear worldview, they end up producing personalities which are fragile, unclear, and weak, and inconsistent. It doesn't end here. It trickles down into every single aspect of human life, human existence, and human personality. And if we had time more, we would elaborate on multiple different expressions of it. Be clear-headed. Torah, Judaism claims you can be clear-headed in this world. So you'll ask me, so I'm a Muslim, and do you say, therefore, I should believe in God and stick to Judaism because it's a, such a wonderful benefit you're talking about? To be clear-headed with all the effects on a human personality, to be a person of integrity, strength, and clear-headed, which I do believe, I'll say, no, 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 no. I don't believe in God because of that. I believe Judaism is the truth. Because I've reached the conclusion that Judaism is the truth. Speaking for myself, did it come easy to me? No. Life forced me to go there. Yes, I grew up from, I grew up from. But like most of us, God himself was, made me feel uncomfortable in the chair until life became so uncomfortable that I was forced to face him straight into his face. And today, for many years, I can testify about myself. I live with 100% clarity, Judaism, Torah, Torah Hashem, is the truth, the truth, not a truth, the truth of this world. Now we are in a generation, for those familiar in the more philosophical, philosopher world, it will be called the postmodernism era. Everything I just said in the last two minutes is completely unacceptable. Truth, absolute truth, objective truth, out. Anybody who walked through a college campus understands what I'm talking about. Torah says, no, I am the truth of this world. 
And that's why so much of this generation is lacking a spine, is lacking strength. Today's personality is hunched over, unclear, distorted. Let's move on. If, Amos Luban, you're so convinced beyond any doubt that the truth screams out, as we will be talking about and elaborating in the next half an hour or so, so then why is it so terribly difficult to get to? You said about yourself. I did say about myself. It was not easy for me. I'll try to respond in two different ways. Everybody will understand it's two different ways of saying the same thing. <clears throat> One way, the first way. Older people in the room have heard this from me many times. I believe the person that usually sits in that corner right over there, the oldest person in this building, <clears throat> he's not here right now, he's not a humble person. He is humility itself. Subtle ears understand what I'm talking about. He's not humble. He is humility. How did he become the actual character trait of humility? He acquired it. He put a lifetime effort into it. Today, he doesn't have to put any bit of effort into it. It's just him. There's every, I have no doubt. I don't know everybody in this room. I have no doubt. We all don't doubt this point. You can tell it by the way he carries himself, by the way he comes in, by the way he sits. He couldn't care less whether you do or do not sit, stand up in front of him. It's the actual character trait of humility walking through. There are people who are humble. He is humility. How did he become it? He acquired it. HaKadosh Baruch says, I cannot give you a gift of a character trait. I'm sorry, I'd love to, but I can't. I can only give you that which you would become through your own toil. If that's what you became, that's what you take with you to eternity, because that's what you are. Same for Midot, whether it's humility, whether it's anger control, self-discipline, Hakol. We're put into this world, we're taken out of the world of Neshamot, into this world, go acquire yourself. Every possible level. Midot, you have to acquire. Limud Torah, you acquire. The Gemara Masechet of Adazara says at some point it becomes your Torah. It's Torah Tashem, based on the first parak in Tehillim. Torah, Shrei Aish, Asher Lo Alach Ba'atzat Reshaim. Uvederech Hataim Lo Amad, Uvemoshav Leitzim Lo Yashav. Ki im betorat Hashem chefzo, uvetorato yehege yomam v'alayla. The Gemara says, so it starts off when you first learn it's Torah Tashem. But when you continue learning, at some point it becomes Torah Torah. Your Torah. What do you mean my Torah? Yes, yours. You acquired it. You gave birth to this idea. It's yours. It's no longer merely God's. It's your me that you acquire. It's your Torah. It's your idea. It's your thought. It's your concept. So too when it comes to our knowledge of Hashem, to our relationship with Him, to our clarity of mind as to whether He is or not, you need to acquire it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, with your bare ten fingers of your mind and your heart. I can't give it over to you. You need to acquire it, otherwise it will never be yours. And for that, I orchestrate a world in which I hide in it, and you're going to have to look for me. That's the secret of Olam Hazeh. Hashem hides in the world. As already the Makubali point out, Balei Kabbalah, Olam milashon ne'elam. Olam, the world, is a place in which God hides, hidden. Look for me, you'll find me. You don't look for me, you won't find me. To say the same thing in a different way, <clears throat> I'm reading inside. Parshat Nitzavim. The summing up of Shalkol Torah Kula, the basis, according to the Rambam, of the entire world of Torah and Mitzvot. See, we read this always, the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. Very fitting. See, I put forth in front of you today life and death. Good versus evil. And the Psukim elaborate. And then it comes and says, Choose life. I, I beg you to choose life. You need to choose it for it to be yours. Why is the world so obscure, seemingly? Why is the world so open for interpretation? Because that's the way I, God, orchestrated it. It's like a psychology test. Come, I show you a picture. Interpret it. Tell me your interpretation. I'll tell you who you are. <clears throat> to understand, people see here these, okay, the world of choice. 
You can either do good deeds or bad deeds. It doesn't begin in deeds. It goes earlier. You know, Api Kabbalah, Chabad, literature, the Tanya, elaborates a lot, a lot. A world of a human being is made up of actions deeper than that speech, deeper than that thought, deeper than that will. Ratzon. Not for now. I'm just mentioning it in this context. Maaseh, Dibur, Machshava, Ratzon. Anybody interested? I think anybody should be interested. It's the way we are. It's the way Torah defines our existence. Four, four chambers, four worlds. So I'm just going backwards. Bechira, freedom of choice, doesn't begin in my actions, to the good or bad. It begins earlier in speech. Because life and death is in the hand of the tongue. You badmap Khalila, somebody in public, you may have killed him. You insulted somebody, even not in public. You may have left a dent negatively in his heart for sometimes for a lifetime. And we know, unfortunately, such stories. To the opposite, of course. You give somebody a compliment. You give somebody a smile. You gave him life for that day. Sometimes for much more. Just a smile. Just a smile is the recipe of life. A sour face is the recipe of death. That's why we don't like seeing sour faces. We're right for not liking to see a sour face. Because it's the world of death coming forth in my world. God says, you're contaminating my world. You want to have a shower, sa sour face? Stay in your bedroom. Don't go out to Rashut Arabim. You're contaminating my world. You want to go out to my world? Smile. You don't want to smile? Go into your bedroom. I'm not saying there are times in life not to smile. There are times in life a person goes through difficulties. But there's a difference between not smiling and showing a sour face. A sour face and many such other negative faces is contaminating God's world. It's throwing bad air into the air. And it doesn't disappear. It remains and it does and it has its effect. How I look at the world is the beginning of the beginning of my choices. I choose how to look. Listen how beautiful Lashon HaKodesh works. The word I, I, the human I, and the words for spring, a water spring, is two different words in English, but in Lashon HaKodesh it's the same word. Ayin means the human I, but it also means Ba'ered al Ha'ayin, for example. Ba'ered al Ha'ayin, Ayin is a spring. What does a spring got to do with the I? Just like the spring is where the water is, where life is drawn out from the hidden, uh, is drawn outwards, surfaced, that's what the eye does. It draws out life into the world. What does it draw out? Good waters of, of life or waters of death? Spoiled water, bad water, that's up to our eye. What we draw out is how we choose to look at the world with an ayin tova that produces life. Ayin ra'a produces death. <clears throat> My world is undefined. It's open for interpretation. Your choice become, begins in how you choose to look at the world. Interpret the world. I'll tell you who you are. But beware, at least Torah will say, you'll be judged, not just over your actions, but also primarily at where it all starts, how you look at the world. It's a choice. And that's Bechavta Bechayim Obamavit. It begins there with which eye we choose to look at the world. It's a choice. I have to take responsibility for how I look at the world. That's why my understanding is that the world is unclear. It's open for many interpretations. Giving us the opportunity to acquire or not acquire our emuna. It's You need to make the call. You, I'm talking to myself, every one of us. It's not going to be ever more clear. For thousands of years, since Churban Abayin, this is the way it is, no prophecy, no miracles. It's a different challenge to find God hiding in this world. I'm hiding, look for me. put the discussion in its proper context. Can I to take this to heart? I think it puts the entire day in a, in a proper context. Likuliyama. Everybody knows what Likuliyama means. According to everyone. Rishonim of Judaism. Mekubalim, for sure, talk a lot about it. And today, physicists, astronomers, cosmologists. Everybody today talks about what scientifically is called the singular point, the beginning point from which the entire world 
all dimensions, space, time, mass, matter, Hakum came from that singular point. It's a Kabbalistic concept. And the Havdu Ben Kodesh Lechol, it's a scientific concept today. Think about, let's think about the implications of that. That means, if everything ever to be, all galaxies, all space, all time, all cultures, people, species, cells, molecules, hakol, every iota of space, every bit of oxygen, hakol, 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 comes from one point, that means that that one point ends up defining everything. And then either way, if you claim that that singular point, nobody turned it on, and nobody chose for it to burst and to produce life, and everything comes somehow from this randomly, from this singular point, that means the entire world is sw uh, swimming in one gigantic soup, or to sound more from cholent, of meaninglessness. Everything is random. It's not shayach to claim that anything is meaningful if the beginning point is meaningless and random. And I'm willing to argue this through with anybody in the world, including many people out there who have PhDs or who are much more intelligent than me. Nothing can have any meaning if the beginning point is meaningless. But the opposite is just as true. That if that burst of that singular point into a world that we live in today, into a universe that we exist in today, came from a godly will? That means, think about the implications. Be honest with yourself. That means that there is no cell, molecule, culture in the world, galaxy, moment in time, the Philippines, zebras, snakes, ha, ko! The changing presidents in the United States of America, North Korea, the, Russia, Putin, ha, ko! There is nothing in the world that does not, does not have the stamp made by God. Hakko. Which means the world then is swimming in one big soup or cholent of complete 100% meaningfulness. Understand, I can tell you, my wife will tell you also, one of my favorite colors is gray. If there's a gray element in things and green, for those of you who are in our house, in the Golan of blue, I like gray. Look, I always buy a new kippah. It's black. It always turns gray in the end. Okay? <clears throat> That's always what happens to our beards. Okay? Recently more. I tell guys for many years before I turned gray, that the, when I was still not gray, <clears throat> many years ago, that I believed that as a person grows older, his perspective of life, and not just his hair, grows grayer as well. I'm the first to say that. With many different issues. For sure, hashkafic issues. Tivaria is a special island in a sea of insanity, I believe. We'll talk about it more when we get towards, closer to those days where it surfaces. Yom HaZikaron, Yom HaTzmod. You see, an entire range over here. People can sit with many different types of kippot, love each other, respect each other, in the staff, body of students. We're here for one. I love gray, but there are issues in where one has to be clear-headed where things end up being black or white. This issue of now, HaKadosh Baruch is a black or white question. It doesn't leave room for any sitting on the fence. I, I'm just demanding for myself, I'm sharing with you, that that's what goes on in my mind every morning when I wake up. Am I sitting on the fence, Al Musliman, or am I swimming in a sea of meaningfulness? That means that there's no iota of space in the world. There's no aspect in my part of my body. There's no part in my whole being and the world as a whole that's not somehow infused with that which the Torah says, It's not my words. Sefer Devarim. Parshat Vait Chanan. You went through Yitzhak Mitzrayim and Matan Torah to realize, Ki Hashem Elokim. Nothing but him. Or as we say in Musaf and Shabbat, whatever the subtle deep term of Torah kavod is, not for now. 
whatever kavod is defined as, fills up the entire Bria. As a kid, a, a son of a very good friend of my wife, he was seven years old, she t- tried to tell him, I always share this, I don't know what the challenge for the kid was. You know, look at the cup. Half of it is full. Half of it, half of it is half of it is empty. <clears throat> Try to see always the half of the cup which is full. We all know that metaphor from the cup. The cup metaphor, the healthiest approach to life. Ein tova. Easy, easier to talk about. A lifetime challenge to put, put to work. Okay. So the kid, his father is a huge, huge physics uh, professor and scientist and uh, Oh Hashem, the Israeli army used his ter- terrific brain. And this is his grandchild speaking. He looked at the cup and said, The empty half of the cup is not empty, it's full of air. I said, to, I, I said my gosh, I'm going to quote you in yeshiva. No end. But no end. I needed that kid to open up my eyes. I also tried to play as Uchacham Alomed Mikol Adam. It's empty. There's nothing here in the, between me and Noah here, dear Noah. No, but, but no. There's oxygen. As the Zohar calls it, late atav panui mine. Late atav panui mine. The Lashon and the Zohar, very often quoted. You'll see it a lot in Sifrei Chassidut for those who learn Chassidut. There's not a place in the world that's empty from Hashem's presence. Let's see. So I'm going to try to put into 15 minutes what so meant to be much, much, much longer. But take these hours, examples of how I, at least I, little me, recommend to look at the world. <clears throat> Rabina mentioned, for the, for the Shana Bet boys, I'm going to try to be there present as well. <clears throat> the most famous Israeli Baal Tshuva in modern Israel, Arav, today Arav, Uri Zohar, if you would have told me when I used to sit in front of the TV in the 70s and I would not miss a week of his show with my entire family, <clears throat> that he would be one day Arab Uri Zohar, I would say, nice joke. His program was called Zeha Sodchani. This is my secret. The program would be, maybe there's something similar in America, three people over the course of half an hour, each person comes on stage, and there is a crew of people, a team of three people, they need to figure out what's the secret of lying behind this person by asking questions. This is the story of the biggest machloket in the world. This exactly is the machloket. Between all the agnostics, atheists, Richard Dawkins, and us, people of Torah. This is it! We claim that there is a Zeha Sochali, there is a secret that's lying behind this world. And this world is only merely an outer garment. It's a, don't Get carried away by it. It's only the outer layer. There's an entire other world above it, beyond it. Rashi and Chumash, Ki Bika Hashem Tzu Olamim. Rashi said that Hashem created two worlds, not one world. We were recently in Hanukkah. The Mityavnim, or the Tzdukim, as we know from research, historical research from our sources, they claimed, like the Greeks, no, 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 no. En Olam Ela Echad, quote from the Gemara. There's only one world. And Chachamim claimed, no, there's two worlds. Olam Azen, Olam Abba. Two worlds, one over the other. In our Chumash year, we spoke about it. Remember, Narata Machpela. Double worlds that sum up Sarah Emenu's life. The world of the temporary moments and the world of eternity that lies behind it and inside of it. Is there a secret lying behind this world? Oh, there's no, there's no secret out there. To phrase it differently. If there is a secret behind the world, listen carefully, please, that means that everything in the world, I'm being very medukdak with my words right now, everything in the world speaks something, a hint, an invitation, come to the secret. Why am I very medukdak with my words? How do you say thing in Lashon HaKodesh? Davar. And how do you say speak? Dibu. It's brought down explicitly in our sources. Everything in the world speaks. There is a, everything in the world says something. You just want, you need to listen carefully to what it's saying. There's a statement behind it. One of endless examples of the beauty and depth of Lashon HaKodesh. Everything, here in English, things speak to things that have nothing to do with each other in Lashon HaKodesh. No! Every, if something is, some 
thing is, it speaks. The question is, are you listening to it? Let's give a few examples. Let's try to listen to God's world. Last winter, <clears throat> there's a firm newspaper in my life. My wife likes, likes reading on Shabbat, Sheva. I forgot to get it to her on, on uh, Friday afternoon. They have it by the Maskirut, by the offices of Moshav Yonatan, where we live. And I said to her, uh, I'll go get now. I almost don't go now. It's late. It's dark. It's raining outside. I'll, I'll go. I'll be back in two minutes. She said, Almost, I know you. You're not going to be back in two minutes. I said, I, I'll be back in two minutes. I just go. I'll get it. I'll get it home. Beautiful Torah articles, a lot of nice content. Tom, two minutes and back. Yeah, right. Our wives are always correct. They're always the ones. Tell me them Sotkot. I go there, I go to the Maskirut, I open it, and I jump back. There were a bunch of 15, 16 year old kids sitting on the floor. I said, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So I smiled, I took the newspaper, and I left. All of a sudden, the door opens. They start running after me. One of them asks, Yeah, yes, you come at the cot. A few, a few minutes? Said, yes. <laughs> wife was right. I come into the room. They're all looking at me, sitting on the floor. Ah, high school kids sitting on the floor and look at me. Lama la amin Bashem? I said, Lama no. Why not? I said, No, no, no. no. I, 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 he explained himself. He's 16, he doesn't, not, he doesn't articulate himself so clearly. I said, you damn up, bonnet the tiyul. Let's go on a let's go on a tiyul. Let's go on a tiyul to the moon. Said them. We're walking on the moon, and all of a sudden the two of us bump into a Toyota car. You know what? Not hybrid the way that we have. Simpler than that. Just a simple Toyota Corolla. You ask me. I don't remember his name right now. <clears throat> Where did this come from? I said, where did it come from? It didn't come from anywhere. It just blew, so you know, somehow blew together. He says, what are you talking about? That's nonsense. He says, that's not nonsense. He'll say, what do you mean? Just the first thing we see, the headlights of the car. There are, notice, he's saying to me, there's not one light, there's two lights. And if you check carefully, Toyota people, our engineers are smart enough to position them, but exactly, in relationship to each other, that they're in tune with each other, they cover as much of the necessary area of, to be lit up on the road at night. It can't be that it can't just blew together. I said, listen to what you're saying. You have two eyes, Baruch Hashem. You have one eye that looks from here, yes. You have another eye that looks this way. You know what you gain as a result? What I gain? You know that you're only able to perceive depth, three-dimensional depth? Only because of the fact that your eyes are exactly coordinated to not look at the same thing from the same angle. Because of that, you're able to perceive depth. If a person were to be born with one eye or blind in one eye, he wouldn't be able to. He would maybe he would understand it, but he won't be able to perceive it. As an ophthalmologist explained to me just a few weeks ago. To understand, yes, perceive not. One can go on and on, and on and on. It's an insult to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we take our bodily functions for granted and we mumble Asher Yatsar and speaking for myself. My wife years ago, not that many years ago, at some point she took a break from teaching mathematics to high school kids and she studied Chinese medicine. Two of her doctors were Western medicine doctors. They had to teach her also Western medicine as well, whatever they need to know for it, to be a Chinese medicine practitioner. And they um, were both Israelis who grew up Chiloni, both became Bali Chubas in medical school. When they saw the wonders of the human body, as a book that, I remember when I was a kid, there was a book about the human body with many pictures, Hamechonash and Lotem, and the incredible machine. Incredible machine. We're not amazed by the machine that we have. <clears throat> and we all know this, these things. I'm emphasizing the, uh, the obvious, but I would like to move on to, because of lack of time, into the less obvious. The less obvious is as such. <clears throat> Look around the room, in our Chumash we spoke about it the first day of the year. And you'll notice <coughs> such a fascinating phenomenon. No two people in this room look alike. <coughs> so, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say everything. 
No two people in this world look alike. All the same items, Baruch Hashem, none of us look alike. What do you say about that, Mr. Dr. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Dawkins? I don't know what he will say. Could there be that behind my physical face, there's a secret, there's a soul that's lying behind it, that's shining through its uniqueness? Richard Dawkins and me, I'm a nothing next to him when it comes to physics, when it comes to biology, when it comes to science. Maybe our great, great, great Rav Chaim Rosenblatt can compete with him. Baruch Hashem. Kol HaKavot to Rav Chaim Rosenblatt, what he does here in the Shiva. I can tell you, I have a sense, just a little sense, that Rav Chaim was a little more humble than the other name that I mentioned. But when it comes to what we're trying to get to right now, you're not any smarter than me, Dawkins. Why? Because what I'm trying to allude to has nothing to do with your field. That which might be shining through doesn't belong to the scientific world. That, may be sh that which might be shining through belongs to a different realm completely. I say it the year, I say it today as well. I have a minag. Some of you may share this minag with me. That if a chimpanzee would walk into the room, that I would not get up in front of him. I wouldn't. I'm assuming most of you also would share that minag. Wouldn't stand up in front of a chimpanzee. Now I beg you, anybody here who will end up making a lot of money, please, every year I beg this, past few years, if you can give a donation to Natibaria, just for the purpose of buying the Natibaria chimpanzee, all year round, we'll be in the biblical zoo, near the mall. Once a year, we bring him in. I'm not embarrassed, I'll go to the back, and I'll say, everybody ready? And I'll bring him in, and we'll bring here. And if anybody's gonna get up for him, it's because you're so fascinated to see him, you wanna see. Nobody's gonna get up because of respect. La Havdil, Hashem will forgive me. There's an old man that sits in that corner. When he walks in this room, everybody in this room gets up. Not because you have to. Be honest with yourself. Why is it that a kid who came off the plane, day one in Elul, from New York City, not all, sometimes, serve boys, they have cynicism pouring out of every single opening in their body. And yet if they happen to walk next to Nevin South, before they even heard of him, they tremble. Why? You don't believe in anything. You're cynical towards anything. Because the truth screams out. What does Rav Nevin Sal possess that the chimpanzee does not? Which I have a need to get up. What does am I, anybody, any human being, including even you, Dawkins? Nobody in the world looks like you. I don't even know what he looks like. Nobody, I have no, everybody in the world looks different. It's called in our sources a neshama. Call it a soul, call it the human mind if you wish. Minds do not belong to science. I always say to scientists, mind your own business. This field, this area, is out of your reach. You have nothing to say about it. You, have, you don't have any PhD there. He'll dismiss all I'm saying. What you're saying doesn't carry any scientific substance. I can't care less. The mind, that's just the, you know, the figment of your imagination. Oh yes? I stand up in front of Uri Zor, who's going to be speaking today. I saw him in action. He gave up on the world of fame and a lot of money in a very painful process that he describes in his book that I read many times. When he came to realize what the truth is, I admire a person like that. A Ben, a true Ben Avram Avinu, who's not willing to go for anything in the world other than the truth, to be at the peak of success, and to be able to pull through, I respect that. I stand in front of him. I want to see Dawkins standing in front of Uri Zor and say, it's just the figment of your imagination. Listen very carefully to when Rebetzin Frankel speaks this afternoon. I stand up in front of her. Many people in the world do. A woman that des deserves admiration worldwide. For if you're not familiar, you'll hear it this afternoon. Dawkins, look into her eyes and say, there's nothing there. It's all the figment of your imagination. I would be there, I would strangle him. Go tell Ro 
Roy Klein's wife, Hashem Yim Kom Damo, who jumped on the grenade to save his friends at the Second Lebanon War as their officer. Go tell Mrs. Klein. It's all the figment of your imagination. I would death sentence him. You see, these are slogans. These are style lines. They don't carry any weight. You're going to start dating a girl. Bezrat Hashem, two, three, four years. Say amen, please. And you'll, somebody will ask you, why did you choose this girl? She has wonderful midot. She seems to have a wonderful sweetheart. <clears throat> she, I think she'll be a wonderful, caring, giving wife. I want to give to her. She seems like she'll be a terrific mother, caring and giving. Care, giving, sensitivity. To what realm does this belong to? It belongs to the human mind. Care, sensitivity. It's all a figment of your imagination. What matters are molecules and cells and the size of the brain. I don't know one person that wanted to know the size of the brain of the girl that he was about to date. Or the number of molecules that she has in her body. You're busy all day. You decided that reality is defined by science. And now you come with Tanat. You're a problem. Your definitions are wrong in the first place. You're busy all day just with a shell of life. That's not life. This is not life. My life. Hashem shouldn't test me. We'll continue to feel even if I don't have this. Human life takes place in one's non-physical entity that science has no clue what it is. Zero. How dare you have the nerve to even open up your mouth, Dawkins, about something that you have no clue. Everything you ever got to scientifically was based on this kazait brain between your ears, which has a mind in it that you have no clue what it is. How even dare you open up your mouth with arrogance as to the nature of this world? I'll finish with the following. <clears throat> I, on the way to your yeshiva, I walk for health reasons. By the shuk, somebody was blasting. How many is in the room? How many? Oh, please, please, please. We all know Agad el Kha? Agad el Kha, Elokei kol neshama, Ve'odeka betoch merov pachad ve'ima. As I walked by, Ba'om ditoch kehal chatzu le'romem. As I stand amongst your people to elevate you, this is, I guess, what I needed to hear on the way. Lecha echa. To you I bow down. Ve'ekaf rosh, and I put my head down. Lecha echa, ve'ekaf rosh. Lecha echa, ve'ekaf rosh. Ve'ekaf rosh, ve'ekoma. You come to talk about God's world? Come like this. Who are you? Arrogant. You have no clue what you, you really actually have between your two years. Science has no clue what the mind is. How dare you open your mouth? When a person is just honest and genuine with his search for the world by reflecting upon it and contemplating it, a person starts realizing what the nature of the world is, that it does have an ongoing secret that's just inviting us to come to discover it. And like a good woman who respects herself, speaking of dating, she will not reveal her secrets only to the one who over time she realized he cares about her. Say with God and us, you care about me, I'll reveal my secrets to you. You don't care to look for me, you're not willing to put in the effort in the relationship, I'm not going to reveal my secrets to you. You'll remain on the outskirts of life. You'll be missing out on life. You'll be missing out on life by living it on the outskirts, on the outskirts, on the outside. Come into my inside. My inside is the world of giving, love. That's the secret of my this world. How do I know this? Right over here. Very, very close to us. We're having the schut of having the, the, the closest yeshiva to Malka Malka Mikdash. Chazal said the world revolves around Eretz Yisrael. Sounds egocentric too bad. Eretz Yisrael revolves around Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim revolves around Beit HaMikdash. Beit HaMikdash revolves around Kodesh HaKodashim. Kodesh HaKodashim is one big bedroom. Not my language. Diver Hayamim. Chadar HaMitot. The room of love where life comes into this world. Bezat Hashem, you'll date, you'll get married. You and your wife will want to bring children into the world. How? Through love. Love defines life and therefore it's the recipe for life. What does Dawkins say about this? What's more beautiful in the world? Hollywood contaminated it completely. Than a new soul, fresh, clean, pure out of the oven of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. As he came into this world as a result of love. What else does one need? It screams out what the essence of this world is. 
this random, by coincidence, it's meaningless, or is the secret of the world the secret that brings souls into the world? That is the secret of human life. And therefore the Torah says that explicitly. It's the heart of the entire Torah. It's about care for the other, love and sensitivity. That's the secret of Judaism. That's the secret of history. When you examine God's world, and you examine history, you realize that it all has one direction, all pointing towards one thing. Why do I say this? <clears throat> Listen this afternoon. There's nothing in the world, and this will really finish with us for today. Nothing in the history of mankind more impressive and exhilarating than the story of the Jews throughout the ages. More impressive than Kriyat Yamsuf itself. Now, I didn't say this. I join in. Rabbi Yaakov Emden said that. I quote it every year. Even if I were to be at the splitting of the sea, it would not impress me as the ongoing existence of the Jews throughout the ages. This is before the return to Zion. This is before the Tivari being able to sit by the Kota and learn. I made this world for love. And any people in the world, individuals or nations, who are going to try to create barriers on that, out of my world, they're going to turn into the dust of history. The Romans, the Babylonians, the Greeks, excuse me, the Spanish Inquisition, Nazi Germany, and so the descendants of Yishmael in our generation. If we had more time, we'd still see the sources inside. Because I wouldn't be surprised with the Islamic control of the world of today in every single airport. It's all brought down, written down, black and white. You want to come? We'll share sources. Anybody who will try to block the way will turn into the dust of history. The only one to remain are those who care to make this world a loving, better place. That's the secret of you, my people. It doesn't belong only to you. You're meant to show the light to the nations of the world of what the nature of this world is about. <clears throat> There's the endless items to reflect upon and to contemplate. A person needs to be honest, genuine, and free in his search. But to be honest, 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 like Uri Zohar in front of the truth. If it's the truth, I'm committed. If not, I'm not committed at all. Black and white. Either everything is meaningful, ain't old milvado, or nothing makes any sense and nothing has any meaning to it. That's the point. The fact that many people prefer to leave their amuna. Ah, maybe, perhaps, and dress it up in all kind of false distortions of the Muna. Well, doesn't the Muna mean you don't really can ever know? No. Doesn't the Muna mean uh, this leap of faith? I still today, I've heard it for 30, 40 years since I came to Mtivaria Hakoto. Guys, tell me, leap, I don't, what does leap of faith mean? I do not understand the word. Many, many distortions. I believe Emuna is the day when a person realizes he's living in the world of truth. Not after he dies, he's we're living in the world of truth already in this world. Bezat Hashem should be a very successful day. Toda Rabba.